text and let's move on to some of the big events of the early church of ancient Christianity. <clears throat> How did Christianity grow uh, pretty rapidly? And like I said, a lot of that was due to the circumstances, the conditions within the Roman Empire. Um, you can see on this map that within 300 years, you know what? Those colors are reversed. My little key is reversed. So that the dark should indicate by 300 AD, um, Christianity had spread to those areas. And a lot of those are metropolitan areas, big cities like Rome, uh, Alexandria, Antioch. The lighter area is um, the growth that Christians Christianity experienced by 600 AD. And you see it's moving into sort of the hinterland, the, the rural areas. So within 600 years, a lot of the uh, Roman Empire uh, has been Christianized and even a few areas beyond. <clears throat> Here are some of the big events uh, within the first 500 years. Of course, uh, there was the events surrounding um, the New Testament, the death and resurrection of Christ and Pentecost, we think occurred in around 33 AD. Uh, Paul's missionary journeys probably occurred in the 40s and 50s, somewhere between 45 and uh, 57 AD. And by the end of the first century, probably around 95 AD, the last uh, books of the New Testament are written, probably the last book, of Revelation. Uh, we think the last apostle, John, died in 100 AD. Pretty old guy. All the other apostles, tradition tells us, um, were killed, were executed, martyred in different ways. So all the events we read about in Acts, those are occurring in the 40s and probably around the 40s, the early 50s of the first century, right? It's not long before Christians experience mistreatment and persecution. And in fact, the first 300 years of the church, Christians experience mistreatment. Now, um, thankfully, it wasn't continual and it wasn't always widespread. Persecution in these early years was often sporadic and it was localized. It would often depend on a local ruler or a particular emperor if he disliked Christians or blamed them for some disaster, then he would uh, decree uh, kind of a crackdown on Christianity and Christians would experience uh, worse persecution. Some of the worst, uh, most infamous emperors um, for being persecutors are uh, Nero, um, who um, probably is responsible for the deaths of Peter and Paul, the apostles in 64 AD. Um, another emperor named Septimius Severus, late uh, second century, early third century, Decius of the mid third century. And then probably the worst is pictured here, Diocletian. Um, he kicked Christians out of the army. He took their homes. He took their property. He um, burned down their churches and a lot of them were tortured and killed under his reign. Um, what's sort of ironic is it really got darkest before the dawn because the emperor who ruled right after Diocletian was Constantine, and he'll be the one who finally gives relief to Christians, and he will be, become a Christian himself. Uh, this picture that you see is a 19th century painting of something Nero did to the Christians. You may have heard he, some believe he started a fire in Rome. We don't know who started the fire. But he blamed the fire on Christians, and he tortured and killed many Christians in Rome in 64 AD, as treated them as sort of scapegoats for this disaster, as this painting. You can see on the right, they're about to burn these, um, these Christians. Uh, persecution, like I said, it was not continual and widespread. It was localized, and it was sporadic, but it could become very intense at times. Then this guy came along, Constantine I, um, because of a vision he saw in which he thought Christ was uh, sort of giving him help to win a battle. He told him to put a certain sign on his standards and march into battle and he would win the battle. And it turns out he did just what Christ said and he won the battle. Because of that, Constantine was very kind to Christians. His own mother, Helena, was a Christian. Um, he had Christians in his administration and eventually in fact, in the very last years of his life, he is baptized and he's converted to Christianity as well. And in 313, 
he passes an edict called the Edict of Milan, which declares that Christianity shall be tolerated as a legitimate religion in the empire. And this uh, sort of signifies the end of widespread persecution. Christians will still experience mistreatment <clears throat> at the hands of people outside the empire, also in the east, outside the Roman Empire, um, towards Babylon and Mesopotamia. Uh, but within the Roman Empire, this is kind of the end of persecution. Uh, so different scholars have different views of Constantine, whether he was a real Christian or not, and whether this toleration of Christians was good for the church or not. You know, some people hold to the view that suffering had a purifying effect on the faith of the Christians. And that once Constantine made things easier for Christians, the church went downhill spiritually and morally. And that's up for people to, to judge, I guess, in reading history. Certainly things changed after this happened, after the Edict of Milan. Over the next uh, century, there were several important meetings of church leaders. We call these councils. And if just about every church is represented at a council, it's called an ecumenical council. And there were a few very important ecumenical councils, one in the first in uh, 325 in Nicaea, which is in Asia Minor, Turkey today. Another in 431, the Council of Ephesus. Another in 451, the Council of Chalcedon. One of the main reasons these meetings took place was to deal with teachings that were spreading throughout the empire that a lot of the church leaders felt were false. They were unbiblical. And so they wanted to hammer out how to respond to these different false teachings. So I'm going to go into those in just a little bit in a, in a second, but just so you can see sort of where they fall. Then the last big event of this period is the uh, downfall of the Roman Empire. In the late 5th century and the end of the 400s, actually throughout the 400s, the western half of the Roman Empire, which includes the city of Rome, uh, experienced a lot of pressure from northern European tribes who were coming down into the empire and uh, seeking to take it over. And 476 is actually the third of three attacks on Rome that Rome experienced during the 400s. But uh, during, in that year, the last Roman emperor sort of gave up his power to a Visigothic king from northern Europe named Odoacer. So that's considered by scholars the end of the Roman Empire, uh, which is not entirely true because it's just the end of the western half of the Roman Empire, which includes the city of Rome. <clears throat> the political entity of the Roman Empire continued to stand on its feet in the east, in, um, in the eastern Mediterranean. But now the center was not Rome, but a city founded by Constantine called Constantinople. So Constantinople became a new center of the Roman Empire, um, but it's debatable whether you still call it the Roman Empire, of course, because it doesn't include the city of Rome. But as far as the, the, legis you know, the legal framework, a lot of that is preserved in the East. So the Eastern Roman Empire, which we call the Byzantine Empire, will last for another 1,000 years after the fall of the West. But yet the West is, you know, this is significant, of course. And now uh, Roman culture and Hellenism will mix with these Northern European cultures and Christianity. And the result we'll look at on Thursday with medieval Christianity, we get sort of medieval Europe, medieval European culture. All right, let's move on to some of the big doctrines that were discussed. 